Well, good evening. Uh, I think I'll go ahead and get us started here. Looks like most people are here that are coming. Uh, my name is David Barfield. I'm Chief Engineer with the Kansas Department of Agriculture Division of Water Resources, and uh, ultimately I'll, I'll be the one that will need to decide uh, whether to approve uh, what we're talking about here tonight, the city's uh, request for changes in its aquifer storage and recovery project or not, and if so, under what terms. Um, so uh, I'm here to welcome you. Appreciate everyone coming and taking time out of your evening. Um, let me figure out how to use my technology here. Head west for West Street. Alright. <laughs> <laughs> so let me uh, kind, of, kind of give you a little bit of an idea of how the evening is going to be organized. We're going to work to, as efficiently as we can to sort of dump information on you and, and then provide a time for questions and answers. Uh, so, so I'll sort of start with just a, a welcome and just an overview. Of, of, um, of the project as it exists now and, and uh, sort of what led to the changes. Um, then uh, I'll invite the city to come up and, and they'll do a, a presentation again on what's, what's driving them to request the changes and, and some, of the, some of the thought process around their proposal, how, how it's structured and why they need it and that sort of thing. And then I'll come back and provide comments on the specifics of, of some draft uh, language that we've developed uh, that would go along with any potential approval. Uh, and I'll explain why we're providing that at this stage of the game. And, and then uh, Tim Bays of GMB2 will come up and provide a little bit of, of their involvement uh, both uh, up until now and, and going ahead. They have a specific statutory role in this process as well. Uh, so we're going to have a number of presentations, and we're videotaping this presentation if you want to see them again or for the benefit of those who, who couldn't make it. Uh, but I'd like to have us sort of just move through the presentations as quickly as we can, and then we'll stand for questions to any of us uh, at the very end. This is sort of how I would like to, like to do today. Uh, I'm, you might have a question that a subsequent uh, presenter is going to answer. So. So again, um, the, the purpose of this meeting is principally to provide you all with information. Uh, we're going to have, uh, as part of this process, uh, a formal public hearing in August. And so that'll be your opportunity to come and bring your comments about what you think uh, about the proposal and whether it should be approved or not, or what terms and conditions would be appropriate. So, so today um, is just about what is being proposed and, and trying to provide you with as many specifics on that as we can. Um, Wichita uh, has the only uh, aquifer storage and recovery project in the state. Um, it was approved in two phases. Uh, phase one was sort of a pilot phase, and it has a diversion on the Little Arc, uh, both the surface water division diversion and, and some what are called bank storage wells in that same vicinity, uh, sort of north uh, of the, the Wichita's well field. And, uh, and they, they divert and treat water there, and then they inject it uh, for the purposes of, of generating recharge credits, but also for the purpose of, of creating a, a barrier to the migration of, uh, to slow down the migration of, of the burden on the coil. Uh, then the project also includes five recovery wells. Then phase two was the main phase of the, of the project. Again, it, it consists of, a, of a, a surface water diversion on low arc where they have a treatment plant and they can uh, treat up to 30 million gallons per day, again, to inject in the aquifer, principally for uh, generating recharge credits so that they can use subsequently. And they have uh, 30 uh, wells that are permitted for recovery of those credits subsequently. So part of the ASR approvals uh, is a rigorous uh, accounting and modeling exercise to track what water is put in the ground, uh, what happens to it, and what water is taken out. Uh, these, were, these systems are dynamic, and some of the some of the some of the water that's put in the system uh, drifts away, and we, we keep track of this through this uh, modeling and accounting system. Uh, part of the approvals uh, is something called a basin storage area. Uh, and it basically defines the part of the aquifer in which uh, the city of Wichita can store water and recover water. And it has uh, a horizontal extent, it has a top to make sure water doesn't get so high that it's flooding basements, and it also has a bottom. And, and the bottoms is one of the big issues here, as we'll talk about. 
So this is a map. You should all have a handout um, that has both sort of a, a summary of at least what I'm going to be telling you uh, through the, my parts of the presentation. And then this map is attached to it that sort of talks about or shows the general configuration of the project. And I'll just walk through it here real quickly. So, um, so the red box is, is basically uh, the, the, the Wichita well field. It's pretty much entirely within that red box. Uh, the gray area is actually what's called the basin storage area, and the boxes are uh, the index cells, and the, we actually do accounting in each index cell in every year as part of the accounting and modeling. So this is what's called the basin storage area. Um, the, the phase one project has a diversion up here north of these three bank storage wells, and it, I didn't show you where that water goes, but it generally goes to sort of this area here. So it's sort of the north and the west side where the burden, burden is right here, which is in this, in this area here. Again, it's to sort of build up a gradient to prevent, uh, really to slow down, not to prevent the, the migration. Uh, the second uh, phase diversion is down here, again on the little arc, but further down. And there's um, diversions that, that sort of go from there and go into the well filled area to, to recharge. I don't show those. The, the blue dots on this are the, the, the city has 30 wells that are currently permitted for uh, recovery of, of credits. And part of the package that's going to be considered in this process is adding these blue, well, these blue dots, which are existing uh, production wells in the city from their native Equispeds right. And they want to add the ability to recover uh, recharge credits at those production wells. And, and so that's part of the proposal that we'll be talking about this evening. Okay. Uh, this is not in your uh, handout, but this is a, the same general area. Uh, again, this is the phase two uh, surface water diversion. It sort of shows how the, how the system is plumbed. Uh, in this case, again, this is phase one with the, the, where that water is distributed. Phase two is, is water is distributed in this area. Here at the blue dots are the existing ones, the 30 wells that are currently permitted, and the gray dots are the, the ones that they're seeking to add. So, uh, so uh, the city will have more to talk about um, uh, in terms of sort of why and uh, what they're seeking to accomplish with the proposed changes, but I'll give a little bit of a history uh, with it. 2011-2012, as, as you all know, was a significant drought. Uh, you know, the, the Equisbeds aquifer has, has been sort of generally recovering over the last 15 or so years as the city has moved its uh, base uh, production from the Equisbed. To, they now use Cheney all they can and Equisbeds as a supplement as needed. And so there's been a general recovery, but in 2011-12 we had a very significant drought, a lot of pumping uh, by everybody. You know, we, we had these drought term permits and multi-year flex accounts that was also uh, and so we saw some of the area go down, uh, especially during the irrigation season, and it started uh, spurring questions of the city as whether those, those bottoms uh, would inhibit their ability to, to take recharge credits. And again, I'll let the city uh, speak more of that later. And, and so that started our discussions with the city on, uh, on the bottoms of the basin storage area, whether they uh, were workable for the city's long-term objectives. Uh, meanwhile, as, as the years have gone on, the, the system, you know, the system's in recovering, and now we have uh, where a lot of the aquifer is full and it's hampering their recharge operations. And so, uh, these are the these are the, some of the drivers behind the city's uh, proposals. And again, I'll let Joe talk more about that later. So, uh, in in uh, after a lot of work between us, uh, the city and the division, and, and really GMB2 is has has, uh, has also been involved. Uh, in reviewing some of the draft products of the city uh, at various stages in its development. Um, uh, in, in November, or I'm sorry, March 12th, the city actually uh, provided me its proposal for what we wanted here. Uh, we, we began a website that, uh, to, to, um, to, that basically has everything, uh, well, all the information that we have available is on the website, the city's proposals and, and, and the backup data and, and, and the correspondence between us is, is all there. Uh, the next slide sort of, kind of is a little bit of a, a guide to some of the more recent work on the proposal now that we've had it. And some of the documents are on the website if you want to dig into more of the detail. Again, 
uh, for the, the March proposal in, in April 19th. Uh, that uh, in, in March 22nd, I wrote a letter to the city and the, and the GMD, and we initiated an initial review of the package uh, just to make sure that the package was complete and well thought out. Uh, in, in particular, we're asking GMB2 to provide uh, its, its uh, an, an initial um, response to the proposals and questions and that sort of thing. Uh, I came down and we had a special board meeting uh, to review all of that, and uh, they followed up uh, on April 27th with a letter uh, with, with their specific comments on the proposal and their questions. Uh, there was a number of uh, not only uh, suggestions for, um, for terms and conditions, but also questions about uh, legal policy implications as well. Uh, we, we also had a discussion on the, the process of reviewing this thing. Uh, the city is actually not proposing a new project. Uh, they're not proposing really expanded um, quantities or anything of that nature. They're basically asking for a, a change to the permit conditions. Uh, and, and again, these additional uh, ability to take credit. So a formal public hearing is not actually required of the reg. The formal public hearing process is required of new projects. But due to the due to the scope of the changes and the significance of the project in the area, uh, we sort of talked about it. And I made the decision that we were going to sort of have a formal hearing process uh, to, to basically establish a record on which a decision would be made. And so I, I basically informed the city and the GMD of that in the May 9th letter. Uh, the city provided its responses to the GMD's comments on uh, May 22nd, and I provided my my responses on June 1. And again, all those documents uh, are on the website if you if you want to look at them. Okay, so um, I think that's all I want to do at the moment. So I'm going to ask Joe Pager to, to come forward and start the city city has some presentations, and then again I'll come back up and, and provide some more on the specific terms and conditions uh, that we're looking at. Uh, thank you, David. Uh, I don't have a PowerPoint presentation, that's uh, the good news, but I have two purposes in my remarks this evening. The first is to thank you for your attendance and participation in this informational meeting. The city has been working throughout this process to try to reach out to as many stakeholders and interested parties and individuals as we could identify to share the proposed changes that we wanted to make of the uh, Chief Engineer in the Division of Water Resources, and uh, I think we've been pretty successful at getting the word out. I told people throughout that process that I would really feel best if it got to the point where I understood the objections and concerns so well that I could deliver those, and that the those that might object or have concerns could fully understand what it is the city's proposing. Second thing I want to do this evening is talk a little bit about the why. And I've got uh, Burns and McDonald as our consulting engineers on this, and Daniel Clement's going to give more details behind our proposal. But as he does that, I want it in the context of the why. We have a permitted aquifer storage and recovery project this evening. Those permit conditions were produced a number of years ago, and conditions have changed in the time since we first envisioned our ASR project. Two big changes. The first big change is that the aquifer has recovered tremendously from the 1993 lowest levels that we had realized in that central well field that uh, is on the map in your handout. From those levels in 93, it has now recovered to very close to pre-development conditions. And as the chief engineer indicated, a significant part of that recovery is the city emphasizing using surface water resources, Chini Reservoir, and using the, reservoir, using the aquifer only to the extent that we needed to for water chemistry purposes and in order to uh, meet customer demand. And by resting the aquifer, it's now at, depending on where you are in the well fill, about 98% or so of pre-development conditions. That's a big change. Second big change is the forecast for future water needs of our customers has changed significantly since we started this project. Specifically, for the next 50-year planning period that we have, 
Our native water rights in Cheney Reservoir and in the Equus Beds are sufficient to meet our customer needs today and the growth that we anticipate over that 50 year period at all times with the exception of severe prolonged drought conditions. So the function of ASR has shifted as these conditions have changed. And today, the permit conditions that we have are not well suited to the new mission of ASR, which is to operate over the long term for the relatively rare, significant drought events to provide water at that time. And as a result of that, we're, we're now facing a, a need, a desire, to have certain changes that Daniel's going to talk about. And those changes are to allow us to use the project to meet our current projected needs in a way that's in the best interest of the city, of the water rights holders, and the general public. Without these changes, we have to operate the project under the old rules, and the outcomes are not as good. And now I'd like to ask Daniel Clement from Burns and McDonald to come forward and talk about our proposal. My name is Daniel Clement. I'm a hydrogeologist with Burns and McDonald. As, as Joe mentioned, um, I'm basically the brains behind a lot of the technical components of this, with, which looked at the effects of drought long term and uh, some of the groundwater modeling components and, and how those fit into the city's long term plan. And so, as we look at some of the technical components of the city's proposal, um, I've got underlined here drought resiliency because that really is the focus of these components. So the three items that David mentioned really that are uh, being discussed tonight are uh, one, ASR recharge and recovery well applications, those individual well uh, locations that will be authorized uh, potentially down the road uh, for uh, recovery of recharge credits. So that's one component. I'm going to focus on modification of the minimum index levels uh, that David mentioned earlier. Uh, the current elevations uh, that are they're, uh, currently within the permit conditions, uh, strand recharge credits during drought based on our groundwater modeling, and uh, then what proposed adjustments would be appropriate so that we can still meet the city's drought demands uh, while meeting the demands and the other demands in the aquifer. Um, the other component tonight that we're going to talk about is aquifer maintenance credits. Uh, aquifer maintenance credits, we believe, are a way to focus on maintaining the aquifer full. Uh, during periods of limited physical recharge capacity. So as Joe mentioned, we've recovered to nearly full uh, conditions throughout uh, the aquifer. That's a great story. Not very many people in the state of Kansas can tell that story. We've got uh, conditions that are, again, nearly full, but that inhibits our ability to physically recharge into the system. So we need a way to still build those credits for long-term drought resiliency uh, while balancing uh, the needs of Cheney Reservoir and Equispeds long-term, make sure we can keep those as full as possible. So this gets into the weeds a little bit. I'm going to try and keep it high level. I'm available after this, and it's certainly during the Q&A session if you guys want to drop into to modeling, but uh, I'll keep it fairly high level until the Q&A session. But, uh, so talking about drought resiliency, the city has basically decided to plan for a 1% drought and planning for a 1% drought through the year 2060. So that's extending the demands that you project through the year 2060 and also accounting for a 1% drought. Well, for those of us that aren't hydrogeologists and hydrologists, uh, what does a 1% drought mean? Well, a 1% drought is basically uh, a drought that would occur about every 100 years. And for our case, we're looking at the years of roughly 1933 through 1940. And so the table, which you can kind of see in the back, uh, and this is all online, by the way, if you guys have any, uh, want to dive into this deeper, uh, we have on the top line here, uh, base demand for the city, which is about 81,000 acre feet uh, for the year 2060. The next row down uh, implies a simulated year of drought, and it's linear uh, for the eight years of drought that we're talking about here, simulating the drought of 1933 through 1940. And what does that mean for customer demand, and how are we going to meet those demands? And as Joe mentioned, uh, the city has two main water resources, and that is Cheney and the Equus Beds. And so you have to assign 
during that drought and your projected future demand, how are you going to meet city demands through that? Well, the city has implemented a drought response plan based on the condition of Cheney Reservoir and has gone through an extensive process that looks at how do you optimize when and where and how you take water during drought. And through that process, the city has identified what they believe will be the demands during that simulated drought. And so in the next two rows below, you have the city uh, demand assigned to the Equispeds and ASR and also the city demand assigned to Cheney Reservoir. And so highlighted here in yellow is the city demand assigned to the Equispeds. Well, the city has native water rights within the Equispeds of 40,000 acre feet. And so by the simulated uh, year two of, of drought, we have a demand of 45,000 by year three, 59,000. So those, that extra demand has to come from somewhere. And as Joe mentioned, that demand we believe is gonna be met by ASR. So we've gotta find a way to meet those future demands and we believe we can do that through ASR. So the next issue uh, is modification of the minimum index levels uh, that deal with uh, the lowest index level at which uh, recharge credits can be recovered. So there's a minimum groundwater elevation at which the city can recover those recharge credits during any situation, whether that be drought or, or normal conditions. And that's currently based on the water levels that were observed during 1993. So our task was to utilize groundwater modeling to simulate how those future demands impact groundwater levels so we can understand what levels would be appropriate to set a new minimum index level that would fit the city's needs and also protect the aquifer long term. So we utilized a groundwater model developed by USGS. Uh, it is the same groundwater model that is currently used for uh, the ASR accounting process. And I believe the GMD is gonna work on leveraging that model also for building a, a GMD-wide uh, groundwater model. So right now we ran that model forward with the simulated demands and the groundwater model does show uh, the results indicate that current minimum index levels basically will strain recharge credits during that projected drought. Again, all of this is in the on, you can grab this stuff online. Uh, the full report's available online if you guys want to look at any of the tables or any of the results or get with me afterwards. I've got a copy of the report with me and we can go through it. Uh, but the starting conditions, if we assume that the aquifer starts out at about 94%, right now we're hanging out at about 98%. If we assume we start at around 94%, have a little contingency in there, uh, we end the simulated drought at about 89% full. And so what we can do with groundwater modeling is we can look year by year of that projected drought, we can look at model output results, and we can understand how groundwater levels change through time. And so in this table, we have both the average water level drop for the basin storage area, which is that big area David mentioned where we can kind of store water, and also the central well field area. So what happens within the, uh, the city's well field? Also on this, we have basically the general average condition. How much are we off from absolute full conditions? So you can see from the table, we start out within uh, the basin storage area at about 94% full uh, starting condition. By the end of year one, we're at 93%. By stress period eight, which is the end of the drought, effectively, we're at 89%. And DWR asked us to look at also how fast does the aquifer recover. And so within this, uh, this uh, results uh, table, you see at the end, we also have recovery years. So we do show that at the end of the recovery years, the aquifer does come back up. And so DWR asked us to add that to the end of the modeling results. But the gist, the takeaway here is that if you look at the second row down, Within the central well field storage area, we're looking at an average water level drop, if you look at the whole of the central well field area, of only about 12 feet. So that's, that's about the average water level drop. There'll be some more, there'll be some less, but those are the statistics from the output of the model. So with those model output results, we can look at 1993 levels, which is an elevation, right, that exists in each one of those index cells that David pointed out earlier. We can look at how the model simulates those levels dropping through the drought. And we can understand, based on our starting conditions and the city simulated demand, agriculture's demand, industrial's demand, river conditions, precipitation, all of the elements of simulated drought, we can project that through time. And so we look at when do credits become unavailable to the city during drought. Well, in red, basically within the first year of projected drought, 
uh, we see that some of those credits would become unavailable to the city. In the index cells highlighted in red, that's essentially within the first year of drought, those ASR credits would be unavailable to the city. And then it just goes on from there. Uh, orange and yellow would be year two and three, and then into the greens up to year, uh, looks like six. And so we, we've got a pretty good understanding from the groundwater model when those credits would be unavailable, but the takeaway is that those credits would be unavailable based on the best information, based on the best science we have to date. Simulating a 1% drought, we have a pretty good understanding and, and at least the evidence that says we will uh, see those levels during drought. So modification to uh, those index levels. So the city is proposing adjustments to those ASR minimum index levels based on those groundwater modeling results. So we've taken the model, we've projected the drought, we've run those simulations, how the aquifer respond, and so we are basing our proposed elevations, our modifications to that 1993 level off the best scientific data that we have. And so those proposed adjustments correlate to roughly 83% full conditions of the aquifer across the basin storage area as an average. Uh, the average ad, average aquifer saturated thickness is about 150 feet, so there's still quite a bit of water left. And the average difference between the existing levels based on 1993 and what we're proposing is about 12.84 feet on average. And again, the, uh, the information and the exact details of the exact elevations is all available online. I've also got a copy of it with me. If you guys want to look at that, just let me know or ask questions after this. So now we get to the second topic, uh, would be uh, aquifer maintenance credits. So the city has constructed ASR phase one and phase two. Uh, ASR utilizes water from the Little Arkansas River when it's available. And we have two places to go with that water. We can either go to direct physical recharge, and that is basins and a combination of recharge wells, or we can also take that water directly to the city to meet demands. So the question becomes, in the conditions that we see now, as Joe pointed out, what do we do when we can't physically recharge into the aquifer because aquifer levels are so high? Uh, we're at nearly, uh, as Joe pointed out, 98% full uh, conditions. So we need a way to build recharge credits into the future to meet that projected demand while still maintaining the aquifer in full condition. And that's what we're proposing. AMCs would propose that we would maintain flexibility uh, to continue to keep the aquifer full while developing a means and method to continue to accrue recharge credits through time to meet aquifer or to meet demands into the future. So the gist of aquifer maintenance credits is that we would take excess water from the Little Arkansas River. If we can't physically recharge it into ASR, we would send it to uh, the city's main water treatment plant to meet demands. Those offsets uh, effectively leave Equispeds water um, as stored as groundwater that would have been pumped to meet those same demands. So basically we're taking water from the Little Arkansas River. If we can't put it in the ground, we can still put it to a beneficial use and take it to the city. That has the same effect of reducing our demands that we would normally meet from Equispeds by the same amount. If the aquifer permits, if we had physical recharge capacity to put it in the ground, the best and single most best use of that water would be physical recharge uh, into the ground. We simply don't have that capacity because we've maintained the aquifer in full conditions. So the gist of it is physical recharge activities would continue, uh, would continue to occur when there is actual capacity in the aquifer. And so the way that we've proposed uh, keeping track of that is through an annual operations plan so we've got some pretty good operations data under our belt. Phase one was constructed in 2006. ASR phase two was in 2012. So we've got over 10 years of operations data that shows us how recharge basins and recharge wells react in their recharge capacity, their physical capacity to take water over time according to groundwater levels. And so what we propose is an annual operations uh, plan that at the beginning of year, we measure groundwater levels at each one of our wells uh, anyway, each one of the city wells. We would take those measurements in combination with uh, index well measurements that are taken every year as part of the ASR program, and we can determine 
uh, physical recharge capacity of the ASR system each year. And so we kind of know going into the beginning of each year how much we can physically recharge and how much would be sent to town during any given event. So I've got a couple of examples here to just kind of show uh, what would happen when we're taking water from the Little Arkansas River. And so example one, uh, if our uh, water treatment plant, if our ASR water treatment plant is running at 15 MGD, if we have a physical recharge capacity of 10 MGD out there in our, in our physical recharge well sites and our recharge basins, we would send 10 MGD of physical recharge to those facilities. So the question then becomes, what do we do with that remaining 5 MGD of water? Well, we would send it to town uh, for beneficial use, leaving that same amount of storage within the aquifer. So the maximum amount uh, of water that could be considered for that period would be 5 MGD. In the second example I have here, if we were running the ASR water treatment plant at 15 MGD, ASR physical recharge capacity under lower groundwater conditions facilitated 15 MGD, we would put all of it in the ground because that is the best use of that water. So the maximum amount that would be allowed based on our operations plan would be zero. We would not be taking an aquifer maintenance credit if we have physical capacity available. So what we're currently proposing is that if we're going to say that we would put it in the ground uh, when, when it's physically there and or when if we have physical recharge capacity, uh, if we don't have physical recharge capacity, we know that recharge credits over time, just like all groundwater, migrates over time. And so with the current physical uh, recharge uh, component, as David mentioned earlier, we have an aquifer uh, uh, accounting program that we run each year that looks at ASR and calculates where credits have migrated through time. What we're proposing with AMCs is a very similar process. We came up with a process and an accounting methodology that we feel like fits, mirrors the physical uh, uh, co uh, component of ASR already, and then third uh, is, is fairly easy to understand, track, and, and, and track over time. And so very similar to uh, the aquifer uh, accounting uh, that's currently done for physical recharge credits, we proposed an accounting process for AMCs. So we review the physical uh, component we have now, which is done based off a groundwater model, and we looked at how we would distribute that water that's been saved and stored within the system. Right now, that currently consists of, within our proposal, a uniform distribution to city wells. So if we took that 5 MGD that we were able to take to the city for beneficial use, we would distribute that 5 MGD, uh, 5 million gallons a day of water to essentially wells within the well field that would have otherwise pumped that water. And then we would look at how we account for that water in a very similar fashion, nearly identical to what physical recharge does over time. And so our proposal includes an initial 5% loss that's very close to the physical component, uh, mirrors that very nicely, and then also a 1% to 5% gradational loss. And the reason for that is we can mirror what the natural system does, just like physical recharge credits over time. Water generally moves in our basin from northwest to southeast, and so we can, we can model that. So what we have put forward is an accounting process for aquifer maintenance credits Again, that's very similar to the physical process. So we would have a 5% upfront loss on anything that we effectively took to the city and kept in storage within the Equispeds aquifer. We would take 5% off the top that first year. And then in recurring years, in subsequent years, just like the physical uh, uh, process, we would have a gradational loss from anywhere from 1% to 5% based on geography. And when we look at how this mirrors our current process, how this mirrors our current physical accounting system, they're very close. The blue line is the current ASR accounting process and basically how recharge credits have accrued through time through actual physical recharge in each year's accounting model. And the green line is doing that same math for accrual of AMCs using what we put forward in our proposal, which is the 5% uh, upfront same year loss and then the one to uh, five percent current. So basically these processes match up. We feel like we put forward a, a proposal where the uh, modeling of aquifer maintenance credits and recharge credits would be very close, knowing that we can model those model those through time. And so with that, I guess I'll, I'll turn it back over to David. If you guys have additional technical questions on the groundwater modeling component or how UMCs work, uh, how groundwater moves through time, 
uh, get with me through this or hit me up during the, the Q&A process. Okay, I'm going to uh, sort of go through um, the proposed um, draft approval documents. So why we created them and, and sort of highlight what they said. Uh, a little bit of this will be repeated, I'll just kind of go through them. So, so why at this stage in the game have we provided these uh, documents? And it's basically, uh, you know, there's some complexity here on uh, the project. And due to its significance and complexity, we've drafted these to sort of show you uh, in the GMD, especially as it considers it, but really the public as it prepares to come and comment at the coming public hearing. But we wanted you to have a full understanding of the terms and conditions that would be associated with any approval. Now, I want to emphasize uh, no decision's been made. Uh, we, have a, we have a process ahead of us to, to, to make a decision. Now, I, on the other hand, I will say we worked hard with the city and the GMD to sort of develop a set of per, uh, terms and conditions that we think could be approved. But again, and meet the regulatory requirements, but that's what the process, we're not through the process yet. Uh, we, we, we've got the uh, public hearing and the GMD's recommendation ahead of us to make sure we haven't missed something. Um, so. Uh, again, so, so what we drafted was, I mean, ultimately the ASR was approved with uh, uh, a document, uh, findings in order uh, that we sort of call a master order that provides the overall conditions for the ASR project in terms of uh, the, the, the general features and terms and conditions associated with the overall project. And then there were specific approvals for each and every part uh, for, for the surface water diversion. It has, uh, it has an approval document that says the terms and conditions under which they can divert surface water treated and inject it in the system. And then there's separate permits for the wells that extract the water and recover the water. So uh, we thought it would, uh, it would facilitate the review of the project to, to show what those would look like. Uh, so uh, so uh, we, we provided those, and this is basically a brief summary of those terms and conditions. And again, all of this is in a little more extended version in your handout. So again, as Daniel mentioned, we, we would lower the minimum index levels to allow the city to recover those credits rather than have to take them earlier in the drought sequence uh, and, and basically off the uh, table in their proposal that's based off the modeling work that they did. Um, we would require that uh, if there's physical capacity, they, they would continue to divert water at the diversion and if, if there's uh, adequate recharge capacity, uh, they would inject it in the system and, and, and develop physical recharge credits. Uh, it's only when they can't do that efficiently that they could accumulate these uh, AMCs uh, for maintenance credits. And only to the extent that the physical recharge capacity was not there. And again, the operating plan uh, would be sort of how we determine what we do. Uh, the AMC rate of accumulation would be based on what they divert and treat uh, under that permit there. So, uh, so it would be limited to those uh, terms and conditions of the existing uh, ASR diversion. Uh, again, Daniel sort of gone through the accounting terms. Basically, we would figure out how much they delivered when they couldn't recharge it. We would distribute those credits uniformly each year among, uh, among the cells according to uh, the, the, num the uh, diversion points uh, in the FS beds in service that year. There'd be a 5% one-time charge, and then there would be an annual charge uh, according to where it is in the aquifer. Again, to, to mimic the, the more detailed accounting we do for physical recharge credits. Uh, there would be a limit on how much they could, uh, uh, how much total recharge credits, both physical recharge credits and AMCs they could generate, and, and that number uh, is set at 120,000, which was basically how far down the aquifer was in 1993. That number is about 12% of the storage in the, um, the well field area and about 5% of the storage in the basin storage area. Uh, they, the city would develop an annual operating plan that again would, would sort of tell us uh, what their physical recharge constraints are. Uh, there are, there's currently an MO, uh, MOU between the city and the GMD that has a couple uh, specific protections um, for domestic uh, users in the, in the area or 
actually bringing those in as, as proposed terms and conditions of our approval. Uh, if there's an impairment of the water quality of a domestic nearby, uh, the city would be required to remedy that. Or if, if the water supply is not available from the domestic as a result of the city's activities, they would remedy that. But those are, those are currently in the MOU. We're just moving them, proposing to move them to the terms and conditions. And then, again, there's a lot more details I, that, that are in there in terms of the metering and reporting and, and accounting that uh, I, I don't think we need to get into in this meeting. Again, uh, all of these documents are on the website if you want to spend more time. So, so uh, finally, I want to just talk before we open up, to, oh, before I turn it over to Tim and talk about um, their involvement that, that I haven't already touched on. Uh, so tonight we're having this informational meeting. Again, uh, this is not a public hearing. Uh, this is just to, to help you understand the project. So if you want to come to the hearing, uh, you can be better informed. Um, uh, I will have a, a pre-hearing conference with, with the GMD in the city and really anybody else that wants to be a formal party in the, in the formal public hearing to come in August. And at that pre-hearing conference, uh, we will set the hearing date, the hearing location, and we'll establish the hearing procedures. Uh, and, and basically just sort of work out the procedure so we know how the hearing will be conducted. So we'll have notice of the pre-hearing conference on our website as soon as uh, we get established and how you can join in. Uh, we're anticipating a, a formal hearing then in, in uh, August of this year. Uh, GMD2 uh, will, will bring its uh, recommendations for the project at that time. And then we'll have following the hearing, so we'll take oral and written testimony at the hearing, and we'll have a period of time uh, where the record will be open to uh, written comments if you want to provide some response to something you've heard, and if, then you can do that. And then uh, I and my staff uh, will evaluate the record and then and make a decision. So, so, so that's what's ahead. Uh, so I, I think this concludes the sort of formal presentations. Again, we've, we've videotaped this, and so the, we'll put the PowerPoint presentations and then a video that sort of captures what you've heard in the, in the presentations on our website uh, by early next week, uh, if you want to have access to any of that. Uh, but, okay, let me turn it over to Tim. Uh, Tim's going to sort of talk about a little bit more about uh, their role, and then after Tim's done, then we'll... Uh, basically stand for questions myself or Joe or Daniel or Thank you, David. And again, thank you all for uh, um, taking time out of your busy um, livelihood, especially agricultural producers to come. And we're fortunate we got some rain. I wonder if our crowd would be quite a bit smaller if we hadn't got the rain, but I appreciate you coming. Um, David said, I want to just touch base real quick on the GMD role. Um, see some new faces here. Some of you may not even know what a groundwater management district is or what we do. Uh, I want to start out with a, a map here, just real quick. Uh, David has already showed some map, and so did Daniel. Uh, Steve uh, Flaherty, our hydrogeologist, put together a map real quick before we came over just to kind of show the, 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 everything on one map, um, just real quick. The, the blue are the currently authorized recovery wells. The, ASR phase one surface intake and bank storage wells up here, and again the Sedgwick intake down here, and then the red is the proposed. Kind of wanted to put all on one map so you could sort of see the extent of, of the proposal. Just real quick, I thought I'd touch base on, on the Groundwater Management District role um, in this process. Groundwater Management District Act, which is KSA 82.8.10.20, recognized the need for local districts for the proper management of the groundwater resources of the state and that it was in the public interest for those districts to be formed. And that's why our district was formed in 1975. Uh, it also, the state, the act also states that it is a policy of the act to preserve the basic water use doctrine and to establish the right of local water users to determine their de destiny with respect to the use of groundwater insofar as it does not conflict with basic law and policy of the state. I think that's important. Um, we have an elected board of directors. And I think we're fortunate there, I think we have eight or nine of our board of directors, I'm going to put them on the spot, I'm going to go ahead and introduce them. They really represent all the water users and the landowners in our district, and they help protect that public interest, that local public interest. It's important that a local board helps establish and protect that public interest. So I'm going to put them on the spot, our, our board president Jeff Winter is here, you either stand or, or raise your hand. Uh, ben Kissick, our vice president, 
Mike McGinn, our treasurer, is over here. David Stroberg, uh, David Bogner, that are on the side. Joe Pager from City of Wichita. Uh, Bob Seiler, uh, Dale Schmidt from up in McPherson. And then our, our staff attorney, Tom Adrian, is also here. I think I'm just missing one board member, if I'm, if I'm correct. If I, if I miss them, let me know. But I think, I think that we've got eight out of nine. So I appreciate our board uh, taking time. They really volunteer all their time. Uh, to come to the G&D meetings, try to understand these, these I think, very complicated um, concepts and do a, a fantastic job of directing staff on, on how to proceed. I want to get a little bit into our role. Um, our role in this ASR proposed permit modification is to evaluate the, the impact to the aquifer uh, and also to protect the public interest and existing water right owners, domestic and non-domestic. We also, as David mentioned, we have a regulatory requirement to review the proposed permit modifications and also review the, the new applications that have been submitted and then make recommendations to the chief engineer. I do want to make it clear the district board has not made uh, any official recommendation concerning the proposed modifications or the new applications. We've spent a number of board members reviewing some of the uh, proposed documents, some of the draft documents, and going back further than that, staff have been um, evaluating this these concepts and the modeling for in excess of a year. As I mentioned, the district is in the process of reviewing the proposal. I think there are really three, three main concepts that the uh, district staff is reviewing and then providing input to the board. Uh, the first is, is a legal review, a technical review, and then the consistency with our existing MOUs with the City of Wichita. I think getting to the Legal review, really we have a fundamental question, is that the aquifer maintenance credits, AMCs, and how can they be accumulated and appropriated under our current Water Appropriation Act and our rules and regulations? And we did submit a, a number of questions to the chief engineer um, after our April board meeting. And the current rules and regulations do govern ASR projects, including defining what an ASR system is, as well as defining what aquifer storage, artificial recharge, and recharge credits are. The district is evaluating uh, how those AMCs fit into those specific regulations. We're also evaluating the city's surface intake um, for phase two permit conditions and how those AMCs can be allowed under that existing authority. Um, I would say the chief engineer has provided a, a preliminary determination that AMCs are only an additional method uh, to, accumulate, to accumulate and account for those recharge credits and or as David has, has said in his letter, a functional equivalence of an aquifer recharge. And the chief engineer has also determined that the AMCs are not passive recharge credits, which are strictly prohibited by the initial ASR orders. We are again evaluating the chief engineer's uh, preliminary determinations. Going on to a technical review, uh, we're reviewing the proposed lowering of the ASR minimum index levels, including the drought modeling uh, that has been submitted by the city and their consultant, and the district board will provide comments and recommendations to the chief engineer. The district is reviewing under what conditions, if any, uh, the AMCs can be accumulated, accounted for, and withdrawn. The district board will provide comments and recommendations to the chief engineer after we're done reviewing. Again, we're also reviewing our memorandum of understanding uh, we have one for phase one and for phase two with the city of Wichita to determine if those proposed uh, modifications are consistent with those provisions of the MOU. David, that is all I have. Just want to let you know we're continuing to review. Um, staff has spent a, a tremendous amount of time. I mentioned Steve Flaherty, our hydrogeologist, has done a tremendous amount of work early on with the modeling, and we're still continuing to review uh, the proposal that was submitted. Thank you. All right, thank you, Tim. And uh, you know, we do appreciate your role and your your, um, your input in the process. It has, I think, been very helpful in getting us so far. You know, we look forward to more as, as we continue through the formal process. So, I think with that, I, I would uh, entertain questions that anyone has, and I'll uh, seek to hear you and then try and repeat the question.